Uh, so uh, again, hi everyone. Um, I'm glad to uh, talk to you today about topic that I find exciting. Uh, and um, this is based on my uh, experience uh, on my previous project uh, a couple of months ago. So it's not like pure theory. Uh, so um, we are going to talk about um, Postgres database and uh, how we can utilize it as a NoSQL database, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, right from the start, I want to make a small uh, remark or update <clears throat> uh, regarding this topic because um, it's uh, not like, it's a bit misleading, right? Because <clears throat> when we talk about NoSQL databases, um, there are like multiple versions of it, right? Well, multiple types. But here we will talk about a document database. And uh, if we are talking about um, document database on top of Postgres, uh, we still have SQL uh, language available to us. So it's not strictly speaking, no SQL. It's um, document database uh, with uh, SQL capabilities, I would say. Uh, but like for, for sake of, shortening, uh, we just call it NoSQL. And we understand basically document database in this regard. Uh, okay, uh, let's continue. Uh, small intro about me. Um, my name is Paolo. I'm uh, working at SoftServe as software engineer <coughs> uh, already four years. And um, my primary focus is uh, .NET, um, but I also uh, had some experience with uh, full stack development. But right now it's more mainly um, backend services uh, utilizing Azure uh, cloud provider. And uh, recently I became a sharp enthusiast. I find it uh, really exciting. And I think every uh, .NET developer should uh, learn more about it and even try to use it. It's um, really, uh, really helpful in our daily job. And uh, <clears throat> in general, this, um, the whole topic is about um, developer experience. I mean, the the, the primary focus of um, um, of this uh, library that uh, was built is around uh, easiness um, for developer in um, his or her daily work, but uh, a bit uh, uh, a bit later about it. Okay, um, so why Postgres, right? We have, as the 10 developers, we probably um, most often use SQL Server and uh, we're happy about it and uh, it's quite performant and uh, it's easy integrated uh, with a bunch of uh, tools around uh, Microsoft ecosystem. But still, um, there is another option and it's called Postgres. It's uh, free and open source, uh, which uh, is kind of uh, significant uh, in, in different regards. Uh, and um, it uh, has been around 30 years, right? It's not something new, it's uh, probably, uh, it's something that was started long ago, but uh, gaining its momentum, I think, uh, um, in .NET community, at least uh, uh, from recently, I don't know, I uh, started uh, working with it like um, half a year ago, like in more uh, more details, right? And I know people uh, that I work with uh, that uh, also started working uh, with it as uh, their uh, persistent database in .NET projects. So it's gaining its like momentum in .NET community. And uh, I think it's worth uh, talking about it. And uh, because uh, Postgres uh, like uh, develop a bit differently from like SQL Server, I would say, right? It's more community driven. Uh, it has uh, like um, good support for um, JSON. Uh, from uh, version 9.2. And um, I mean, right now it's uh, about uh, version 13, but it's in preview, but um, like most stable version, I would say it's uh, Postgres 13.2, uh, if I'm not mistaken, or 0.4. So 
so it's like uh, was uh, like JSON support was added uh, like a while ago, uh, and it's not something new. But um, um, it wasn't like easily um, available for .NET developers out of the box. So we would have to do some modifications, like some some uh, internal um, infrastructure stuff. Uh, should be implemented manually in order to get some benefits of it, right? If you're working from .NET um, project um, with uh, Postgres or from .NET Core. Uh, and uh, what I found also uh, like a good site about using Postgres, it's, it's cheaper um, than SQL Server, I would say, Comparing to SQL Server as a service, because I mean Postgres is free, it's open source and free, so it's it's like understood, right? But when you are utilizing it as service, right, uh, from Azure or from other uh, cloud providers, it's still cheaper than SQL Server, and uh, it also a like, good point, and uh, it's uh, one of the options that uh, you would think about when you like want to choose technology for your project, right, or base it on your budget. So how good uh, is Postgres JSON support, right? Uh, we have uh, two like main options. Uh, we have JSON type, which is um, basic type uh, uh, for JSON. It stores uh, like raw JSON uh, in text without any modifications. Uh, without removing like duplicate keys or making some uh, change in order, uh, but it lacks um, indexing and um, it's not uh, very suitable for like, for our needs uh, as uh, probably common um, small to medium size, I would say, uh, applications because uh, eventually we, we need some indexes, we need some uh, ways to um, speed up uh, search and so forth. But it's good for fast, re uh, for fast write. If, you, if you're doing some like uh, uh, streaming system and you want uh, like uh, continuous uh, write, um, JSON type and um, plain JSON type probably will be your option. Uh, but it has also, I mean, Postgres has also has JSONB Mm, type which is binary, right? JSON, and um, um, what? Uh, but um, the main difference between two two uh, is that um, binary, as it uh, stands, right? It uh, serializes JSON into binary format, and it's doing some uh, pre-processing, like uh, removing duplicate keys, uh, uh, ordering um, keys in a certain way, uh, and uh, the main benefit is so we can utilize indexes around it. And um, one, uh, I mean, the, the next um, big feature of uh, JSON support from Postgres is that it actually um, has a good set of uh, uh, functions and operations that um, allow um, modify or like alter in any way your um, Content in, in binary table in JSON binary uh, in column, and um, uh, it also has I didn't mention here, but it also has ability to write your uh, stored procedures in JavaScript, right? Because it's convenient to operate on JSON object using JavaScript. Okay, <clears throat> so how 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 fast uh, this um, uh, whole performance of uh, JSON operations uh, on top of Postgres. Uh, there is a company called Ongres, uh, which uh, did some, well, I would say, very thorough and uh, detailed uh, comparison between uh, Postgres and uh, uh, MongoDB. Because <clears throat> when we talk about uh, document database on top of Postgres, we probably uh, would want to compare it apples to apples uh, with some document database, which is like uh, uh, commonly used, right? And uh, the first, uh, which is came on my mind, at least is MongoDB. Uh, it's uh, also like um, Cosmos DB is also a notion, right? But uh, uh, 
if we're talking about uh, free and open source and uh, that we can uh, install uh, or run on our machine with uh, Docker, uh, it's probably Mongo would be, would be a better option. Right? So um, they did this comparison uh, between Postgres and Mongo. And uh, uh, the results was quite uh, uh, outstanding, right? So they discovered that in some, in some cases, uh, Postgres uh, was outperforming uh, Mongo uh, in different uh, ways. I, I encourage you to go uh, uh, by this link or you can uh, Google uh, uh, based on this title, like uh, performance benchmark, uh, benchmark uh, from Ongress and um, read through this document. It's very detailed and uh, quite uh, like uh, long to read, uh, but it uh, has uh, good uh, insight in uh, how performant Postgres, right? <laughs> I took some of the uh, information from this document uh, just to show you like uh, what was the comparison like. Uh, we are not, we will not like go into all details. It's just um, some insights of what was measured and how it outperforms. Okay, so if we um, consider that we probably want to use Postgres as our next um, persistent persistent uh, mechanism uh, for our data applications, what would be the means of uh, combining uh, .NET and Postgres, right? And uh, it appears that um, some guys already um, thought about this um, problem and uh, implemented uh, a library uh, which is called Martin. And uh, um, this is quite interesting project. Um, if you remember um, back in uh, 2010s, probably uh, like 10 years ago, it was a popular um, dependency or inversion um, uh, of control container uh, in .NET called structure map, which was way before like .NET introduced uh, or uh, ISP.NET introduced their own uh, inversion of control component. And um, so this Martin uh, is um, uh, written by uh, the same author or the same authors. Uh, and uh, it has uh, pretty, uh, I would say active uh, community uh, around it. And it's actually actively developed right now uh, and uh, has good uh, documentation. And uh, I mean, the whole talk about this, uh, I mean, the main, uh, the main point uh, that uh, I was uh, working uh, with this uh, technology in my uh, past project. So this is not something not out of uh, the blue, it's something that is, uh, was uh, used in production. So what is Martin, right? Uh, Martin is a library uh, that um, allows the ten developers to utilize um, Postgres as a document database, right? And um, it uh, presents um, uh, or it allows uh, utilize it as um, document database in a way that uh, you uh, do not need to configure um, or like do not need to do special configuration to uh, establish some uh, relations, some uh, tables, some mapping from entity to some like uh, DB set, etc. Right. So um, the main the main um, uh, reason behind or the main principle behind Martin is to uh, improve developer experience because uh, um, quite often uh, we want to write some like uh, simple functionality without uh, uh, necessarily uh, like doing lots of infrastructure configuration, etc. right? Maybe we uh, want to do some proof of concept or maybe uh, we uh, want to start with small and uh, continue uh, 
increase um, our application and uh, decide to do additional configurations later, etc. Or we want to uh, do some integration tests uh, which utilizing actually our uh, database, right? So we want to see like uh, that actual um, creation of our objects uh, and uh, uh, see how they create, etc. Because I mean, all this is much simpler with Martin, in my opinion, <coughs> than with, uh, I would say, uh, entity framework, right, or with MongoDB. Uh, okay, um, let's proceed. So what are key features of uh, Martin, right? Well, because it's um, on top of Postgres and uh, Postgres is a uh, relational database, uh, it's totally ACID compliant, right? So it, what it means is that <coughs> when we create uh, or we're doing right operation, uh, we can be totally sure that uh, once this operation is completed, we actually can um, right away uh, query uh, this document and uh, get uh, what we expect without uh, uh, some eventual consistency that is common in NoSQL world. Uh, it also supports multi-tenancy out of the box. So you don't need to uh, write additional call code to implement some multi-tendencies, just, just turn off, um, uh, uh, turn key feature like uh, Microsoft is uh, like to say for some, for some of their products. And it also supports soft deletes. Uh, again, this is a very common scenario where you do not want to uh, completely remove uh, your entity from this database, but just want to mark it as deleted, right? And uh, this is also <clears throat> very easy implemented um, uh, utilizing Martin. Uh, it also has uh, compiled queries a feature that uh, allows uh, do some like uh, pre-compilation and uh, utilizing this uh, pre-compiled query for continue uh, for consequent usage usages to minimize overhead of uh, uh, compiling your where uh, like clauses with uh, link provider. Uh, it also allow uh, querying uh, raw JSON, right? Like uh, modern uh, document databases allow it to do like uh, Cosmos DB or MongoDB. So I mean, there's very nice feature to have. Uh, this uh, eliminates overhead of uh, um, deserializing entity from raw JSON in your .NET code and then serializing back uh, to output uh, when you want to just return what you have in document. It also has a bridge API uh, and we'll talk about uh, it a bit later. I mean, what means reach, right? So it has flexibility uh, for me as a developer to uh, work with different type of uh, sessions. And uh, this is actually uh, semantically uh, very helpful because uh, when you want to do only read, you create only read session. And when you want some dirty track checking, you just utilize uh, another type of uh, session. And uh, the main feature, uh, very uh, like interesting feature, I think, and a very big feature that it has, it has even store support. And uh, we will talk about it a bit later, what it means. And again, um, this uh, like key features, this is um, not like all features that it has, it like feature that I find interesting. And uh, if you will start working with Martin, you'll probably find it um, different in another way. I mean, interested in another way. What, what is interesting for you, I mean? Okay, um, the main component that you will work with um, and utilizing Martin is uh, document store is like the central um, piece is like um, DB context if you compare it with um, entity framework. Well, you do all your um, configurations like uh, connection to database, um, defining some indexes, defining foreign keys, uh, etc. And um, the um, one like um, uh, specialty or one uh, key um, um, differences in this uh, object is that uh, it should be created a singleton for your um, 
database. So it's one option per database. And you probably do not want for, to forget about this because um, we had some scenarios where uh, we were uh, generating it, uh, we were creating it uh, like multiple times in our database, in our application, uh, uh, and uh, it uh, causes some uh, performance issues. So just remember, remember that it should be singleton. And um, what uh, it expose is uh, a different set of que uh, sessions. So um, in entity framework, we do not have like these differences, like we uh, operating on the uh, result uh, of I queryable, right? You can set uh, as no tracking or you can basically yeah, it's, it's no tracking uh, as, as I think compared uh, with um, Martin and uh, uh, framework. But in um, and Hibernate, you have this option uh, also of different sessions. And the session is like um, uh, your uh, unit of work or unit of work scope. So when you create session, you create um, your open connection, you do uh, your work. And uh, when session is closed, um, you are committing all your changes and connection is closed. And uh, we have like four main options in Martin uh, for the session starting from the uh, like most uh, lightweight is query session. And uh, as it explains itself, it's just for query, right? right? So when you create a query session, you understand that uh, all operations uh, will be performed uh, only uh, read only, right? And you can't modify anything. The lightweight session is a uh, um, read and write session, but without uh, identity map support. So when you read something with uh, uh, within lightweight session, it uh, and when you read it multiple times, uh, you actually hit in uh, database multiple times. And uh, to um, uh, to resolve this issue or to um, improve um, um, uh, this uh, like read operations, you can utilize a regular session, I would say, or general session where you have these uh, read write capabilities, but with identity map support. So, what it means is that once you read some entity and uh, when you later want to read it uh, from other session, um, document uh, or Martin actually uh, checks whether this entity has already been uh, loaded. Uh, in some previous session, if it, it if it has been, it just uh, uh, returned back to you without hitting actually database. And uh, the last one is a dirty track session, is when you have uh, uh, features uh, with uh, everything from previous three, and uh, uh, you also have this um, like a, uh, ability to automatically detect what you changed in your entity. So in um, in lightweight session, in regular session, when you um, change your entity that you received from database, you have to explicitly say that um, I mean, this entity has been changed and it has been stored, and then you can save changes. And um, without actually storing the entity, um, I mean, Martin will not understand that you changed some. I mean, some assumption in it. I will show it uh, a bit later. Uh, but in uh, dirty track session, I mean, everything happened automatically. So it, uh, Martin knows like um, that uh, you changed something. And uh, once you save changes, it just uh, save your changes. And, uh, but this uh, of course comes with some uh, costs of uh, tracking all this with some mechanics that uh, performed um, uh, in process, like which is not always uh, good in, I mean, uh, performance wise, right? So you probably uh, want to use some light weight sessions uh, at some point, knowing that it will, um, will add some uh, steps that you uh, need to take care of, but it will uh, improve you know, performance of application. <clears throat> Okay, uh, let's uh, look at some uh, demo samples. Uh, I'm going to open my uh, Visual Studio code. Uh, 
Do you see my Visual Studio code? Please. Uh, yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> for today's demo, I'm going to utilize uh, uh, .NET interactive uh, notebook. Um, if you're not familiar with it, this is uh, something similar to uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, for Python, uh, which basically allow you to combine some description of uh, code, uh, the code itself, and the result of execution of, uh, of this code uh, in one document, which is a nice uh, feature for, for the demo purposes, right? Uh, okay, <clears throat> so um, let's start with configuring Martin. Um, let's say we have some application like running airports, right? And let's say uh, you want to track flights and uh, you have your flight object, you have a passenger object, right? And the passenger object uh, or class has uh, some bag information, right? And th this is probably a um, good uh, example of uh, something you would probably want to store uh, as one document, right? Because passenger doesn't make, say, doesn't make sense without the flight, right? So passenger, this is person who is on the flight. The person is like a separate entity. It might be stored separately, right? But passenger, I would say, is directly related to flight. And the uh, same goes with back. This back this is something is um, related to the passenger and his your her luggage. So <clears throat> I would want to store it as one document. And uh, uh, in order to uh, do uh, or to save it. Uh, uh, to Postgres database um, uh, in uh, in a document uh, on document DB way, uh, we're going to utilize Martin, right? So what we want to do, we want to um, install uh, NuGet package called Martin, and uh, in uh, .NET interactive notebook, I just can utilize this um, special syntax <clears throat> for referencing NuGet package and automatically uh, adding it to my uh, chunk of code. I'm going to uh, create a, a constant for a connection string to connect to my database uh, just to like uh, make it more clear not to like read it from some file, etc. And uh, <clears throat> the actual um, initialization of uh, Martin and document store goes like this. Uh, you create um, you, you utilize a uh, fabric uh, a method uh, that uh, uh, feed it uh, with a connection string and you actually you do not really uh, need to uh, add uh, this piece of uh, additional configuration like schema for um, in your regular application but because I'm working uh, in uh, .NET Interactive Notebook uh, the um, the type of uh, or the name of the uh, type that I'm instantiating uh, has some additional uh, like special uh, symbols in its name when it's read it with uh, a reflection and uh, the the way it uh, uh, utilizes it in Martin and the way Martin wants to create automatically a table for it uh, causes some issues and uh, uh, like for simplicity sake, I just um, add in some special um, alias for my uh, table or basically for my object. Uh, and this alias will be utilized by Martin to create a document um, table in Postgres uh, uh, with uh, exact uh, name. And uh, I find this uh, like only additional effort that I need to uh, do. Uh, here, but uh, in your regular application, you will not need to do it. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, so let's execute this piece of code. We like defined our classes, right? Uh, we have this uh, green check mark and uh, everything um, uh, run without issues. And next thing I do is uh, I inst uh, like run uh, initialization of Martin and <clears throat> um, Remember when I said that uh, Martin is developer centric and it has additional like um, features that we as developers probably uh, 
uh, will find uh, uh, very interesting when we do like our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, implementation on my on our local machines probably right because uh, we uh, definitely do not want to um, call this um, piece of uh, Codes uh, on production because uh, what is doing is just uh, wiping out all the uh, tables and data that uh, you have in your database. So uh, on the left side, I have uh, my uh, connection open to Postgres that I'm running on uh, Docker uh, on my local machine. And uh, uh, what I just did is I initialized. Uh, uh, Martin and I removed everything that uh, it has previously. And uh, if we go to check, uh, we see that nothing is present in my uh, public uh, schema, which is default schema in, uh, that Martin utilizes and default schema for Postgres. Uh, okay, uh, what I want to do next is I want to add some entity, right? And uh, let's start with lightweight session. Uh, again, lightweight session is a read write session that. Uh, uh, has no identity map enabled. So this is just um, the simplest uh, read-write session. And uh, what I'm going to do is just I'm going to create some flight object, uh, add some passenger to it, and add some uh, luggage to passenger. And um, uh, what you, uh, what I like to draw your attention that uh, you see uh, here, I'm trying to uh, print out uh, ID of the flight before actually uh, creating it into database. So uh, Martin uh, tries to assign ID of the entity that has been um, that's to be uh, created in database before actually uh, it's created in the database. So uh, the, way it's in, uh, the way it's doing is that uh, if we, uh, for example, if we have this uh, ID um, defined as GUID, it will utilize sequential GUID uh, to assign ID to our entity. And um, uh, again, we don't need to, to hit database to generate sequential GUID. Uh, if we want to uh, stick with IDs, uh, it utilizes um, a scenario called high-low, uh, which is a common scenario to, again, um, to generate uh, IDs uh, for your object. And uh, uh, let's try run it. Uh, so uh, we are adding an entity. And yes, <clears throat> you see, uh, I have uh, added entity. We print out uh, the ID of the entity, which was uh, ID, and we uh, saved uh, it into the database. And if we go and check out our uh, database, we see that Martin created the uh, table called MT underscore dog underscore flight. <clears throat> it created it automatically. And uh, the convention of Martin that all tables that is created by Martin uh, uh, prefix it with MT underscore. And uh, dog underscore in our case is, um, it means that uh, it's for documents, and you will see that we have other kinds of uh, empty databases, uh, empty tables, and it is created also an empty high-low uh, table uh, for uh, exactly for purposes uh, of uh, generating uh, the IDs um, uh, for our uh, objects. And, Sorry, I, yeah. I have a question. Sure. Ask. So for that ID. Uh, before we call save changes, does that mean that uh, this Martin makes additional database call to verify that high low, uh, what is the latest ID value currently in database? Or how um, do we know which ID to assign? Yes, I think uh, it, uh, uh, at some point it like refreshes, refreshes its uh, like uh, state of uh, high low algorithm, but uh, it's not necessarily like uh, to, uh, to um, uh, read um, your uh, uh, to read this table all the time. It just have the state of uh, um, like high level algorithm that is utilizing for uh, generating IDs and it refreshes its memory and at some point just flashes flashes it into uh, the database. So I mean the way this algorithm is working is doesn't require you to um, continuously pull your 
uh, pull your uh, table. But mm -hmm. we can look into this table and see, yeah, it's, so it has like initial value of zero, right? Uh, and um, uh, we like had this state that uh, the first ID was zero and it's uh, uh, like uh, assigned the next value. And uh, I mean, the high law algorithm is uh, definitely an interesting topic, but is, I would say is another topic and uh, um, it has also good documentation. But uh, I mean, essentially what it allows you to do is allows you to do like uh, generation of uh, IDs with uh, like uh, consequent, I would say, manner uh, without uh, like actually uh, continuously pulling, pulling for the next, uh, for the uh, like last ID in your database. Okay, uh, so let's look into the uh, detail that we have. So we have table <clears throat> uh, where, uh, so this is like a regular table, like in SQL and then other um, SQL Server I and mean, other relation databases, right? Uh, but uh, we also have this uh, data column, uh, which is JSON type, which is actually, uh, this is, um, this is stored uh, in binary format. It's not in plain text format, but uh, the way uh, this uh, like um, uh, tool uh, of uh, or extension of Visual Studio <coughs> Connect and um, reading Postgres uh, allow us to like, read uh, or see uh, textual representation. So it, it uh, deserialize uh, on the fly this uh, uh, binary format uh, into text one. Uh, but in database, it's in, in, in binary form. So let's <clears throat> let's see it um, a bit, uh, in a bit um, more readable way, uh, what we have. Uh, we have our ID assigned, we have some values, some unassigned, some assigned values, and we have our passenger uh, dictionary with one or area with one passenger assigned to it. And uh, again, uh, ID is not necessarily, uh, it's something I forgot to remove because I had different uh, demos where I have this ID. Uh, and uh, in, this case, uh, in this case, ID is not assigned because uh, it's internal uh, entity of the main document. And uh, so um, the main point that uh, you, uh, wasn't required to do any um, configurations, pre-configurations apart from this like uh, alias, uh, which is uh, like uh, specific to this uh, .NET interactive notebook. Um, and uh, you saw how the um, uh, ID being uh, assigned before we actually hit the database. And this is a quite a common scenario when you want to utilize or you, when you want to implement domain-driven design, right? When you, um, in domain-driven design, when you um, have your aggregate entity for, or you have entity, for example, right? An entity has identity uh, and identity, this is something uh, you would probably want to uh, generate yourself probably uh, on some algorithm or uh, with GUID or with uh, this high low uh, algorithm, etc. <clears throat> and uh, we uh, certainly can define this ID ourselves if we uh, if we created this uh, fly object uh, like string ID, right? Uh, but uh, let, let's uh, uh, let's say um, we decided uh, to leave it to uh, Martin. Okay, um, uh, let me just go back. Uh, so why am I working? Yeah, so yeah, the, uh, the also one difference with uh, document, uh, sorry, .NET Interactive is that uh, your Vim um, for some reason start working uh, in this case. So you uh, have something to do on your own. Okay, um, we talk about adding entity, let's talk about Query entity. So <clears throat> to query entity, um, I uh, will instantiate another uh, session, uh, which is specifically for uh, query operations, right? 
and uh, let's say I try to like read uh, my uh, flight by flight ND, and uh, I'm going to clean up the cell output just to see that it will actually have some return results. Okay, so uh, we uh, what we did here is just we opened a uh, session, we actually opened connection here and uh, uh, specified the workloads uh, based on the one of the um, properties of the document, right? So this is uh, something that we had uh, hidden here, right? And um, um, because we uh, are having this in JSON B, uh, format uh, we can actually create some indexes around it so if if uh, I would want to create an index for the flight no uh, font number right uh, what I would need to do uh, is just to define uh, as, um, uh, like index like this I would say that uh, I would define schema for flight and uh, yeah, so I would say that I would want like, to have an index. And uh, what uh, it will create is it will create a, a, a so-called uh, gene index, uh, which is uh, like a, a one of type of indexes of uh, um, Postgres that, utilize, that allows actually uh, create index on on your uh, data, I mean, on your document. Um, but um, as uh, what I noticed is that uh, these uh, gene indexes um, utilize uh, some CPU resources uh, in more way than uh, I, mean, I would regularly uh, utilize or in, in, in other ways, like Postgres will regularly utilize resources, right? So <clears throat> if you are doing like lots of reads uh, based on this gene index and you have uh, like uh, not uh, so powerful machine, your CPU usage will be like um, uh, high and you will hit some probably some issues with it. And um, what we can do instead if is that uh, we can actually uh, create not an index uh, but a duplicate field uh, and what it will do is that uh, uh, yeah actually i didn't specify it the uh, predicate right it will duplicate for example this fly number and um, what it will do is it will um, it will create a separate field uh, in uh, database uh, in table. Uh, sorry, uh, along with uh, uh, data uh, column, it will have another column for uh, flight number <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, we will have, um, uh, so we will not have this computation index that uh, continuously uh, refreshed, right? We will have a separate um, uh, value stored in a separate uh, column, uh, and this will uh, be uh, indexed, and it will be uh, much more efficient in terms of uh, CPU usage, and it will improve um, uh, speed of your read operations, but with the cost, of course, it's not a perfect world. A world with the cost of uh, uh, adding or duplicating this um, uh, property of flight <coughs> into a separate field, right? Uh, so, yeah, this is just a uh, side note. And uh, because uh, we like um, utilizing our uh, document. Uh, database on top of um, Postgres, uh, we can uh, actually utilize uh, its um, um, constraints uh, that it has like, and uh, if you want to uh, check uh, some foreign key, for example, if we have um, uh, passenger and the passenger is uh, associated actually with some person, the person, this is uh, something that we will probably would want to store as a separate 
um, entity in a separate table and we would probably want to reference uh, this uh, person um, by uh, person ID in your uh, passenger in your passenger uh, object and uh, the way uh, we can uh, do it is uh, we can uh, specify that for this uh, entity we want um, actually I had another demo uh, we want to have uh, index of uh, I mean we have um, property of person ID um, treated as a foreign key for the uh, person object and we would need just to create a person uh, with let's say just ID first name last name and uh, just name whatever and uh, in this case um, uh, when we create uh, a person and if we are if we will not uh, specify a person id or if we specify a person id which is not existent uh, um, martin will throw an exception saying uh, so this is like an exception that we would have that um, this uh, insertion of passenger violates constraint that uh, flight ID keep it because I mean flight ID this is was like previous um, association that I had but um, like we can run it uh, with um, different uh, uh, scenario for the for the person um, and uh, what else um, but um, but the main uh, the main uh, feature I would say that is more interesting uh, to me and that is uh, probably will be uh, more uh, will take more or will have more adoption I think is uh, even sourcing uh, feature so <clears throat> or even store feature of Martin and uh, what uh, what is even sourcing even store um, is uh, let me go back to my uh, slide and let me have this um, uh, description of this uh, taken from the Martin Fowler, Fowler <coughs> site that even sourcing that is something that uh, ensure that all ch changes in application uh, like code uh, as uh, separate events right? and uh, uh, we uh, have a log of these events uh, and we can uh, go back in history uh, in our application from some event, uh, from one event to another event to understand uh, what was the state of certain like, uh, entities uh, in a certain time, right? And uh, this is quite interesting uh, feature. I think it's uh, like have uh, less adoption in the net world and it's more, uh, have more adoption in, um, in enterprise uh, in Java um, ecosystem I think <clears throat> but um, it also have its like usages and we also used it in our previous uh, project and uh, I find it quite interesting I mean it it, adds, it, it has uh, some uh, complexity it adds actually complexity right uh, but it has uh, also advantages of uh, having more like raw uh, details of uh, events that happened uh, within the system and uh, uh, in context of uh, our uh, demo oh actually yeah uh, let's uh, quickly look through this slide so uh, let's say <clears throat> in in terms of Martin if you want to uh, utilize um, uh, or implement even sourcing your system in your system you would use even store right and even store uh, operates on a stream so um, when you have um, if you want to capture your events you uh, would probably capture it in in the stream uh, in the stream context and uh, you would uh, append your events to the stream <laughs> and at some point of time uh, you would want to get like the actual state of the system right or a certain entity for example and uh, what you would need to do is you would need to do a projection uh, so what is projection is uh, like uh, aggregation of um, 
events that happened uh, from the start of the stream to a certain time. And uh, uh, the way Martin allows us to do is uh, like have these uh, three type of projections. Uh, inline projection is something you do um, each time you add a new event. So uh, let's say I have event one <laughs> and on event one, I would uh, create inline projection of, uh, of the stream based on the event one. If uh, event two um, comes next, I would create another projection based on event one and event two applied. So basically um, on event two applied on top of what we had previously stored. Uh, as inline projection, uh, and uh, if um, so, this this comes with the cost of performing this uh, inline projection uh, each time we add a new event, right? So this is probably not uh, based choice when you have a continuous stream of events uh, and you want to capture it as quickly as possible and you want to process it later. Uh, then we have fly projections. Fly projections, uh, this is something uh, that uh, is uh, uh, happens on demand. So uh, it means uh, that uh, when you write uh, your events, like one, two, three, and uh, when you, for example, uh, at some point uh, want to have um, on demand by some read operation, by some query from the UI, want to get the actual state of uh, the system, uh, you just uh, call um, live projection and all events that happen before a certain time just aggregated into or processed um, with a certain way and uh, you present it with uh, the outcome of all events applied. Uh, again, this is uh, probably suitable for continuous stream when you want to read uh, or write all the time uh, as much as possible, but you do like um, these uh, aggregations uh, not so often, right? Uh, because uh, again, it will, um, it will aggregate all events in your stream to some point. And we have async as a third type of projections. We have async projections, uh, which means uh, all these events uh, uh, will be processed uh, sequentially. Uh, and uh, based on these events, uh, the projection will be updated uh, each time, but uh, asynchronously, I mean, in like in the background, uh, process and uh, Martin allows us to do it has like um, I think uh, the demon like um, uh, like with completion to uh, Linux demons uh, what it will do some uh, background um, aggregation of your events okay and uh, let's have a quick uh, demo of uh, this event feature uh, in Martin um, so um, in order to um, apply events uh, uh, to your um, entity or to have like a projection of your events, <coughs> you would uh, probably need um, a separate um, uh, class uh, with uh, exposed public uh, methods uh, that has apply, like they call it apply and that uh, takes uh, argument uh, typed uh, by your um, events that you producing. So let's say we have a flight and we have events like uh, flight started, right? flight ended and uh, passenger added, right? <clears throat> and uh, in my flight projection, uh, I would have um, apply methods for each type of uh, event. And uh, within this apply method, I can do like whatever I want. Like um, uh, speaking about uh, flight projections, right, um, it will be reasonable uh, to process this uh, passenger added uh, event with actually adding uh, passenger to the list of uh, um, passengers uh, of the flight. And uh, uh, let's execute it and see 
that it executed uh, correctly. So I just updated my um, declaration of flight um, with this uh, apply methods because our previous declarations didn't have it. And I added all these additional classes. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's um, uh, do a clear configuration of uh, Martin because uh, we and just to not to mess with everything that we had previously. Uh, what I would need to do uh, in order to enable this um, event feature. So if event store features enabled by, by default. So you can uh, you can um, create your streams um, uh, in, in any time. You don't need special uh, configuration. But in order to create inline projections, you need uh, to add this configuration uh, of um, events uh, having inline projections with uh, aggregate stream with flight. So we are saying that um, our events um, will be aggregated, uh, with, I mean, with certain times will be aggregated in this uh, class of flight. And uh, let's execute it. Uh, let's see that we have empty database and we have empty database and let's um, add um, so actually yeah before before we add uh, or append a certain um, uh, certain events we need to create a stream before we because we are appending events to stream uh, you also can create uh, or martin create a stream uh, on the fly uh, with append uh, and if it's not existed, it's great, but you have to feed uh, some stream ID. But uh, let's say I'm creating uh, a new stream from start. So uh, I see that I created a stream and uh, let's look at the database state. I see that we have um, uh, three uh, tables created uh, streams, uh, which uh, has uh, a new stream created for us, right? Uh, uh, we have events which is empty uh, because we have no events and we have event progression which is kind of a um, system table that allows like to track <coughs> at which state we are uh, when we are progressing uh, through the events of this uh, stream and um, uh, let's say i want to add a couple of uh, events to our stream. So I captured uh, event uh, or stream ID as stream ID um, um, variable and I'm feeding it uh, to my append event because again, you're appending uh, event to some stream. And um, let's say I add two events. <clears throat> and uh, what should happen? Uh, because we have inline projections, each uh, time I append a certain event, it will um, uh, call this apply uh, methods of the uh, our um, aggregate object or uh, projection object and uh, do some operation that is like um, uh, contained here. So in case in case of uh, passenger added, I uh, will add uh, certain passenger to my list, and uh, in case of uh, flight. Uh, started uh, event, uh, I will uh, assign started at property uh, to my flight object. <clears throat> so we will have started, um, flight started, um, initialized, and we will have some passengers in our passenger. And uh, uh, let's check out our database state so yeah i um i called this uh to uh events and uh, martin created a separate uh, table for us again uh the same way it created a document um, I mean, table for documents uh, and uh, we can see that here uh, we have our object of uh, flight uh, with uh, all details uh, that we just uh, talked about. So let's quickly check it out. Um, so yeah, um, you see that um, 
I have flight started as initialized and I have passengers assigned. So you see that <coughs> through the events and through the stream, uh, we updated um, or we created an object or projection, uh, not like uh, directly by, uh, by, but uh, like indirectly uh, using these events and uh, having uh, it, these events applied uh, continuously as they appear. Um, another case um, that might be interesting is um, this live projections. So let's um, again uh, create uh, a new uh, document store and uh, remove everything that we have in our database. And uh, yeah, we just removed everything. Um, you see that for the um, for the live projections, we actually do not need to add anything. Again, this is uh, not really necessary to add because um, we just uh, uh, utilizing clean um, clean uh, document uh, store uh, object. And uh, how it works. Um, I, again, the same way I need to add uh, or create a new stream. And uh, I'm appending the same uh, events. But you see in this time, I do not have my uh, document table with flight uh, for the flight object created because uh, I have a stream, I have events uh, created in a stream, but uh, they were not applied. They just stored as a raw stream, uh, as, a, as a raw events. And um, I will create uh, this flight object uh, on demand uh, on the fly. So when I call this, um, again, let's clean this out, but uh, when I call uh, events aggregate stream, uh, to the flight object uh, with stream ID, it should return. So actually, let me just try to clean this output. For some reason, I can clean it. Okay, um, let's execute it. Okay, uh, you just saw that um, I have a flight object uh, being uh, composed or like created and I mean, uh, based on the events that we had in this stream. And uh, uh, I just received a result with our uh, like object. Um, uh, uh, and it was like visualized. And I mean, because uh, we have this weird name in the uh, .NET um, interactive notebook, so you see this uh, weird naming of objects. Um, and uh, we actually do not have any anywhere stored uh, the oh, actually yeah we do have the table but the table is not like populated it's just created because we have this uh, aggregate uh, stream created uh, and dot uh, net I mean Martin knows about this flight object but uh, because of this uh, aggregation was live uh, we didn't store it anywhere. And um, um, this is how it works uh, in Martin. So um, yeah, the, the last uh, projection type uh, uh, regarding async daemon, uh, I won't show here, show here because in uh, the net interactive, um, it uh, won't be easy uh, like to create um, background process because like it has some limitations. Uh, but um, how it basically works is that uh, in your uh, document store, um, you create uh, in, in the events, uh, like uh, type you create your uh, daemon, uh, daemon uh, action. I don't really remember how it's, how it's uh, available through the UI, but uh, I mean, it's all written in documentation. Okay, uh, yeah, and the, the main purpose is not to like go through all features um, uh, in details with all uh, like covered. The main uh, point is uh, I want to uh, draw your attention to this type of, uh, to this type of uh, feature uh, that, um, uh, Martin provides and uh, 
I would say that Marzen uh, like um, has like blend of uh, two worlds, or like right, uh, sequel and no sequel uh, into something new because uh, previously it was like very hard to implement uh, something similar like using document uh, database on top of SQL database. And um, again, uh, there are uh, like the there might be lots of ways uh, where you you would want to actually write probably row SQL to do some uh, additional aggregation or some complex scenarios uh, with your document uh, stored in Postgres and with your tables, plain tables stored in Postgres probably. And uh, I mean, this uh, will be possible uh, on uh, on this in this kind of scenarios. Uh, that's probably all from myself, uh, from me for today. Uh, again, uh, the resources uh, that uh, you, uh, I encourage you to check out is this uh, Smart and DB IO um, website itself, which is like a home of this project. Uh, the Jitter chat that allows you like to get contact with actual developers, uh, ask some questions and uh, uh, get feedback and, uh, and they are really um, are responsive and uh, nice, nice people. And uh, the GitHub itself, uh, of course, uh, where all the source code. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be gladly uh, answer them. <laughs>